Okay, cool. So welcome everyone uh, to our um, session on the DSA and impacts on Latin America. I am Javier Paliero, a Global Policy Director at Access Now. Uh, we'll be doing this in English, as I said to several of our uh, participants today. We have um, now more than 32 or 33 people joining, which is pretty much the exact amount of people who, who signed up, which is, I guess, in the, in the um, uh, realm of organizing events, a success, you always expect less people than the, the people that actually sign up. But everyone's here, everyone's very excited. We actually had to stop the, the amount of people interested because it was insane. There was a lot of people very interested in knowing more about this. And just to keep the conversation more fruitful and, and, and specific, we, we just said, okay, let's put a cap on 35 people. But actually we had like some somewhat like 50 people uh, interested in counting and we had to stop it. Uh, but well, just um, we have people here who are going to say more interesting things than myself. And our first panelist in this, in this front is Daphne Keller, who works at the, um, at the Stanford Center for, it changed names, right? Because I still have in my mind Center for Technology and Society. You're muted. Mm -hmm. Juan and I are both now at the program for plat on platform regulation at the Cyber Policy Center at Stanford. So we're still okay. at Stanford, but we have a different acronym and a different, you know, organization around us. You would understand that we sometimes have a hard time with the acronyms and all the, the entities in which we're working on. But thank you so much, Daphne, for being here. And then um, the main point for her presentation is going to be just the background and importance of the current debates for human rights regulation of content and how this plays out in the context of the DSA. So uh, Daphne, if you want to go first, yep. you have your 15 minutes there. Thank you. Um, and I'll try to keep this relatively brief, just because I suspect that this is a group that already knows quite a bit about this subject. Um, and so I want to save time to get into discussion. Um, I think the connection between human rights and the intermediary liability laws or other laws that govern platforms ability to regulate online speech is a subject that Latin American experts have always been particularly well attuned to. Um, Latin American laws, <clears throat> including the Marco Seville in Brazil, the Belen Rodriguez case in Argentina, uh, Chile's judicial notice copyright takedown law, some court rulings in Colombia, Mexico's right to be forgotten ruling. There's just this really impressive body of law and civil society expertise um, on the ways that platform regulation is in fact regulation of people, of platform users and their online speech. Um, so I, I think this audience doesn't need to hear that so much, um, but the rest of the world has been relatively slow in catching up to that point, um, to, to kind of grasping that issue. And so the DSA, uh, I think in a way, shows us how EU focus has really shifted to understand uh, how platform regulation has consequence for, consequences for the human rights of users. And, and you can see that in the way that it focuses on things like procedural rights of users, uh, giving them a notice when their content is taken down, either based on the law or based on a platform's terms of service, giving them a right of appeal, giving them an ability to go to court um, and, and challenge decisions made by platforms about their speech. Um, so the, the DSA in a way can be seen as Europe moving into more recognition of these human rights concerns. Um, at the same time, it does so by putting so much heavy process and obligations uh, around online content regulation that I think we should have a real concern that it will entrench the power of the small number of platforms that can afford to carry out those new obligations. And, and so you know, it, it may have a significant downside as well. Um, the other, just to flag a couple of other things going on in Europe in parallel with the DSA that relate to platform regulation and human rights, we have the terrorist content regulation about to come into effect there. Uh, the, the final parliament vote on that is pending. And that creates some very troubling capabilities for local authorities to order platforms to take down content very swiftly. Um, we were spared, uh, thanks to some serious negotiation in the, the um, final from the parliament in, in the, the final 
rounds. We were spared from having it explicitly impose an obligation for platforms to monitor user content using proactive screening technologies like the GIFCT database. But in practice, I think we should expect that a lot more of that kind of screening uh, and proactive filtering will happen because of the terrorist content regulation. Which brings us to the third really important pending development, in my opinion, in Europe, which is there is a case before the CJEU right now, the highest court of the European Union, about Poland challenging the filtering mandates in the copyright directive, the famous Article 17. And Poland is bringing freedom of expression based arguments saying this will harm the free expression rights of users. And so sometime in the next year, hopefully, we will get a really interesting ruling from the CJEU telling us more about this really important connection between filtering mandates and users' fundamental rights uh, to freedom of expression. It, it's also worth noting some other fundamental rights issues that are slowly bubbling up that aren't about free expression in Europe and elsewhere. So the um, judicial precedent in the EU on filtering mandates mentions consistently that filters might threaten users' fundamental rights to privacy and to data protection uh, because it puts the platform in the position of monitoring all of their speech and inspecting it more than they otherwise might or more than a non-ad <laughs> targeting driven platform <laughs> otherwise might. Um, this is an issue that is not teed up in any litigation that I'm aware of, but that is really important and might also raise an important set of arguments in the Latin American human rights context. Um, another maybe uniquely European angle is that the courts have me consistently mentioned platforms right to do business, which is a fundamental right in, right in the EU, as a barrier to filtering mandates. Um, that's not something that seemed very interesting in the past, but the more that we look at new mandates as a burden that smaller competitors to today's incumbents can't carry, the more interesting that uh, fundamental right argument might become. And then the, the final fundamental rights issue that is more and more discussed in civil society and academia, but not in any court rulings I'm aware of, although please tell me if you have anything, uh, is the equal right to equal protection or, or rights against discrimination. Because increasingly we see studies showing that when platforms are hasty and deploy flawed filtering technologies to take down users' speech, uh, those filters don't apply to everyone equally. For example, there are studies showing that speakers of African-American English are falsely tagged as engaging in hate speech by automated tools more so than other English speakers. Um, and so equality rights and disparate impact issues, I think, are an important emerging issue. And, and again, maybe one that can be teed up well in the Latin American, inter-American human rights framework. Um, so that's kind of what's going on as I see it over in the question of when can states make platforms take down content and what unintended consequences might there be from putting that responsibility or that liability on private companies. But the other question that has really emerged strongly in recent years uh, is about platforms own power to take down content, enforcing their terms of service to take down, for example, former US President Trump, you know, sh should private platforms have this power to decide on the speech rules or should the state override that somehow and say, hey, platforms, you don't get to decide. There are certain content that you have to carry. And this is um, a topic I addressed in an article called Who Do You Sue? That might be, if you're interested in this, might be worth taking a look at, especially the second half goes over the US law on this in detail, like when and how, if ever, can the state force platforms to carry content they don't want to? The answer in the US so far is that the platforms always win these cases. Um, nobody has ever succeeded in forcing them to carry content. And I think the likelihood is that they never will, although it may come to a Supreme Court case. Um, but as you guys probably know, in other countries, that's not necessarily the case. So there have been orders for Facebook and YouTube to reinstate content in, uh, Germany, Poland, Italy, Brazil, maybe other countries, please tell me if so. Mexico has a proposed law that would limit platforms uh, ability to take down content. And I think this is something where the law is 
just underdeveloped. <laughs> like we will see a lot of changes going forward. But if you're interested in places where it is relatively developed, um, Matthias Ketteman and a co-author whose name I always forget um, have a, a great article in English describing the German case law and explaining how the, the Drittwirkung doctrine there plays out in requiring, potentially requiring Facebook to carry content. He and I are doing a panel on May 18th organized by a um, Brazilian organization, uh, if you're interested in more on that. Uh, big picture, I think this is absolutely a question about the intersection of competition law and speech law. You know, if we didn't have just a few gatekeepers um, controlling access to the major, major forums for public speech today, then it wouldn't matter so much what speech rules any one of them imposes. Um, so in that sense, it has a huge overlap with questions that have been raised in the past in communications regulation, questions about the regulation of broadcast or cable or other sort of gatekeepers with bottleneck power over online discourse. The other problem, of course, is in the US at least, but I, I suspect also in a number of Latin American countries, if you compel platforms to carry every single thing that's legal, they will be carrying a bunch of porn and bullying and threats that are barely legal and you know, support of terrorism that's barely legal and pro-anorexia content and pro-suicide content, it's just, you know, horrible stuff that nobody actually wants to see. And so there's a real question of, you know, what can the law do um, that hopefully, you know, doesn't get you to this point where platforms are effectively useful, useless for a civil conversation um, be, because there's just so much garbage on the internet. Uh, so I imagine we'll be talking more about that later and I will stop and hand off to the next speaker. Thanks so much, Stephanie. I mean, you've, <laughs> you've opened the door to like at least five or six very controversial issues that we could discuss right now. Um, and just having in mind one thing, which is for uh, all participants here, um, if you wanna uh, pose your questions, you can start doing this now. We will address them at the, uh, by the end, like after the presentations. But if you want to start like having questions, um, you know, um, saved here in the Q&A uh, function in Zoom, you can start doing that right now. Or either, otherwise you can also raise your hand during the Q&A part after the, the presentations and, and just speaking about risks which of which uh daphne identified several of them um data protection in the in the in the context of uh, filtering in the european union also discrimination but also of course content uh, you know excessive content removals extra extraterritorial orders and so on there are several things that we can see as um as risks uh for free expression or or things that are, if, if they're done uh, poorly can represent a risk for that. So to speak about that and, and, the, and how this will probably land uh, into a Latin American context, we will have Joan and, and Luis Fernando. Joan can go first and then Luis can add. Um, so Joan, if you were so kind, just come to us. Joan Barata works with Daphne, um, as, as, as we just said, in the Stanford Cyber Policy Center, and he will be joining us for this uh, section now. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Javier. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to be here today. Um, I will basically follow up on some of the things that uh, Daphne already, already mentioned. Um, when it comes to, to Latin America, I would say that um, there's a difference in terms of uh, international or regional standards that is particularly relevant in this debate. Article 10 of the European Convention on Human Rights contain, contains Lesser, a lesser amount of safeguards and protections when it comes to the right to freedom of expression, at least explicit protections compared to Article 13 of the American Convention on Human Rights. I think that, um, I mean, uh, the, the way, for example, the prohibition of censorship or even the prohibition of indirect restrictions to freedom of expression deriving, even if they derive from, from private actors, these are elements that uh, will be, I'm sure, that are will be part of the Latin American discussion and are already part of the Latin American discussion when it comes to seeing um, the way platforms 
can be regulated and the things that platforms can and cannot do. So the Dritt Wirkung discussion that was mentioned by Daphne in the case of, of Latin America, and looking at, I'm considering Article 13 of, of the convention becomes uh, particularly, particularly interesting. On the other hand, it's true that there are no decisions from the Inter-American Court of Human Rights uh, when it comes to the internet, but uh, we can only hope that uh, very soon we will see a decision taken, taken by the court. And uh, I would also invite civil society to find a good case to bring to the to the court because I think that I mean the, the inter-American system has already very good standards in place established by the special rapporteur on freedom of expression starting from 2013 when uh, Catalina Botero uh, published a series of standards that are I think that they're extremely uh, important but on the other hand as I said there are no decisions uh, coming from from the inter from the court in in, in San Jose uh, also I mean it's important to 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 know that uh, whereas the discussion in Latin America can really focus on uh, human rights issues I mean Europe uh, we have I mean the, the the issue of platform regulation basically or the discussion about platform regulation takes place within the context of the European Union and here we are talking about the context of the construction of the internal digital market so there I mean um, economic uh, issues the issues of uh, competition uh, establishing a com um, uh, level playing ground between different companies in different parts of Europe is uh, it has some sort of a priority um, in, uh, in, in, uh, in when it comes to the discussions. Um, in, the, in Latin America, however, I mean, apart from the influence coming from the European system, the, 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 the American system, we also have, we see more and more the influence of free trade agreements, either agreements signed with the United States or agreements signed within the Pacific uh, cooperation framework that more and more are establishing provisions in the field of uh, platform regulation. And for example, what triggered the discussion in, in Mexico uh, is precisely the, the need to implement the so-called TMEC, the free trade agreement between Mexico and the United States that uh, include, uh, that incorporates a, a series of clauses that establish that Mexican, the Mexican legal system needs to basically incorporate the, the section 230 into the, into the system. So I think that, and this is where, I mean, uh, this is when we started to see all these discussions taking place in Mexico, some of the, uh, the proposal made by um, the, the senator, so on, so on and so forth. But when it comes to, to Europe, it's true that, uh, I mean, the, the, the human rights perspective or the user's rights, rights perspective is being incorporated more and more into the debates. However, this being said, uh, it is also true that one of the main focus, policy focus of Europe in Europe is not human rights, but the harm, the, the need to mitigate the harm, the power, uh, the influence, or even to redefine the responsibility that big platforms have. At least this has been a way the rationale uh, of uh, and the way, I mean, uh, European authorities have justified the need to reform, for example, the e-commerce directive via the Digital Services Act, the proposed uh, Digital Services Act. So I think that, I mean, the discussions are still very much based, at least at the political level, on the fact that platforms are presented as extremely powerful, extremely harmful when it comes to certain societal values and the need for Europe to re properly regulate them in order to preserve certain principles, certain values. It's true, again, that if we take a look into the DSA, new safeguards, new protections, new rights are granted to users, but at the same time, something that we can miss is a proper assessment of the impact on fundamental rights that some of the obligations imposed on platforms can have. For example, there's a reference and in Article 26 and 27 of the DSA uh, would impose, if adopted, uh, on platforms the obligation to mitigate systemic risks. Systemic risks that are defined as something that goes beyond the prevent preventing illegal content. Well, I mean, there are there are a few references to, to, to the need to properly respect taking into account freedom of expression, but the, 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 the a proper assessment, uh, the need to articulate a proper assessment on the impact, the, the, the need to really prevent 
any excessive uh, uh, intrusions, violations of the right to freedom of expression, this is something that is still cannot be clearly detected in the wording of the directive. Something that also needs to take uh, to be taken into account is the fact that most of the decisions or some relevant decisions taken, uh, adopted by a court with regards to platform regulations, regulation have been taken by the Court of Justice of the European Union, which is a court, this is not a human rights court. Of course, I mean, in their decisions, the court has to take into account the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union, but basically, I mean, the considerations that are, I mean, that on the basis of the decisions of the court are, go basically or are in the field of uh, preserving the internal market, interpreting EU law, uh, so on and so forth. So now the way, I mean, uh, fundamental rights are, are taken into consideration when it comes to these decisions is still particularly weak, at least in some, in some cases, um, very recent cases, by the way. Hmm? The other thing is that we also have in Europe the European Court of Human Rights. So, and uh, the European Court of Human Rights has had the chance in some specific cases to say a few interesting things, but uh, we still don't have a systematic approach to these matters by the, the European Court of Human Rights. And on the other hand, it's still hard to detect or it's difficult to detect a dialogue between the two courts. I think that the two courts more or less move in, in, in parallel, decide in parallel, and we still don't have a proper uh, discussion that combines the, the approaches of the two courts when it comes to two decisions. Um, of course, I mean, here, I mean, perhaps the most relevant human rights decision when it comes to platform regulation that will be adopted by the court in Luxembourg, the European, the, the, the Court of Justice of the European Union, um, is the case uh, with regards to the case that has been mentioned by Daphne, the case brought by Poland to the, to the court on a possible violation of the right to freedom of expression uh, deriving from Article 17 of the Copyright Act. And I think we will see how the court decides in this matter and a very much expected decision. We were also expecting any time the, 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 the report from the, from the Advocate General, uh, but it apparently it has been postponed until July. So, I mean, bummer, uh, we will have to wait a little bit more for this uh, very much awaited uh, decision. Um, another thing that is particularly complicated or I mean challenging in Europe, is um, the, the the issue of uh, jurisdiction and counter, the jurisdiction and um, the interpretation and application of the principle of country of origin? This principle seems clear. Huh? Um, it would be far more challenging to apply it in a, in a Latin American context because every country has its own legislation and may have its own legislation. So here, I mean, platforms perhaps will be reluctant to be under the jurisdiction of the different, all the different states um, in, uh, of Latin America, unless these states can offer very, uh, let's say, favorable regulations to, to the platforms. But in Europe, I mean, the, the, the establishment of the, of, the country, of the country of origin or, or principle now is being eroded by the existence de facto of very important national pieces of legislation uh, in Germany, in France uh, under discussion that basically will not respect this idea of the country of origin or will make it very challenging to apply the principle of country of origin in, in Europe. So here we have a very particular challenge. Um, France seems to um, be willing to ignore the DSA process and to adopt the, its own uh, I mean, the law regulating platforms. We already have the German case. The way, for example, the future DSA will let's say, interact with these already existing national laws is something that is still, still to, be, to be said. Um, the other thing uh, is that, I mean, in Europe, we have um, lots of overlapping uh, directives and regulations. And uh, if we add to that the future DSA, it's going to be very complex to interpret, in many cases, the, the solution to be given to a certain problem. Because apart from the general framework provided by the e-commerce directive, in the future to become the DSA, the Digital Services Act, we have the Copyright Act, we have the Audiovisual Media Services Directive, we have the regulation on terrorist content online, and even the GDPR. All these 
I mean, pieces of legislation regulate platforms uh, in different ways from different perspectives. And uh, I, I believe that problems of interpretation, problems of harmonization, when it comes to all these different pieces of legislation, and in some cases, different um, criteria when it comes to jurisdiction, I mean, gonna, gonna, uh, are gonna become more and more important. And my last, my last um, reflection here has to do with the role of regulators. Huh? Uh, in Europe, we have independent regulatory authorities in the field of media, not only telecom, but also media. In Latin America, uh, audiovisual regulators are far more scarce. Um, Europe, author, European authorities seem to be in the position of trusting uh, audiovisual regulators uh, when it comes to fulfilling new tasks in the field of uh, platform regulation. This looks to me as a very optimistic approach. And uh, because, uh, I mean, audiovisual regulators are still have not adapted, fully adapted to the new audiovisual media services directive. So giving them new uh, competences uh, in, in the field of platform regulation will be very complex for, for, for some of them, uh, even in a context of a country of origin, because at the end of the day, um, uh, regulators will have to cooperate across the European, uh, the European Union. So I think that this is a particular challenge. And if we look into the Latin American scenario, also finding a proper independent regulator in many countries when, uh, for the purposes of regulating platforms might be particularly particularly challenging. So finding, I mean, the proper regulatory authority to implement some of these positions is an open question in Europe. And I think that uh, this would also become something particularly challenging when it comes to the Latin American environment. So this is in a nutshell, these are the things that I wanted to mention. I mean, basically looking into the challenges of some of the conflict problems that we have in Europe that can also I mean, cross our borders and not for, for the best. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. And speaking of adding layers uh, and dimensions of analysis to, to our conversation today, um, you just mentioned um, among several very important points, the differences between the human rights frameworks that are play, um, the differences between the political contexts and what it would be understood or desirable from authorities. To, to make happen. So to speak a little bit about that and, and how this looks like from the Latin American perspective and from our human rights framework we have um, and the challenges here, right? And specifically uh, with regard to specific legislation, like for example, Senator Monreal's pr proposal in Mexico that generated the civil society engagement um, and, and a lot of pushback, uh, we must say, um, to, the, to the, that kind of, of proposals. And um, for that, we have uh, Luis Fernando Garcia here. He's the executive director of R3D, Red and Defensa de los Derechos Digitales, a Mexican um, digital rights organization. And he has experience as well working with the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, if I remember correctly. So he was well suited to give us a, a look at what we can expect and we, we can see in, in the human rights framework uh, in Latin America for these debates. Nice to see you all, Feliz Cadafne. Joan uh, and all the colleagues are connected here. I mean, I just saw a list of who is here and I think I'm gonna say a lot of the obvious things, but I, I hope something that I say seems interesting to someone here. Um, but um, I mean, Daphne and Joan have, have already said some things that I wanted to say, just gonna emphasize a little bit about um, how unique the um, perspective or inter-American perspective for this issue can be, but often is not, because obviously most digital issues um, are discussed first somewhere else. And uh, it's unfortunately sometimes easy to get lost on that in Latin America. And we feel like the only options of policy options or the discussion options are the ones being provided by the discussion that happens in Europe and the United States. But of course, as, as, as some of you have already mentioned, uh, there are differences that provide both opportunities and risks uh, uh, regarding this discussion. Uh, and I think Mexico is an, a, a, a good example of, of all these forces um, at play in this discussion. Uh, so first, just to quickly go through the why 
I say so much that the inter-American view is unique. Um, uh, it's um, important to take into account that, as Joan said, Europe's Article 10 uh, is way more restrictive in paper on freedom of expression, but also the inter-American uh, um, uh, conception of, of freedom of expression differs from the one from the US, even though it was very heavily influenced by it. But actually, a long time ago, I took the time of reading the 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 Travox Preparatoire, the 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 work in the the the, the discussions of the American Convention on Rights, and actually opposed the, the, the 13 of the American rights. They were against it. And they were saying to Latin American countries like, you don't want this. We have it and we had kind of like repented to give too much freedom of expression. So you shouldn't, of course this was her and about the menace and all that. So they didn't want freedom of, Latin Americans to have freedom of expression. So. But the delegates from Latin American countries said, no, we are really believing in freedom of expression and we're going to have this Article 13. That, that's just a historical side note. But the, the, the difference between the US conception of, of, of freedom of expression, of free speech, and the freedom of expression in the American systems comes from the, um, the, the general obligations of human rights. In, in the US, Freedom of expression, freedom of speech is seen as only imposing restrictions to the state, imposing restrictions on speech. Uh, while in the inter American system, we have a more, uh, uh, I, I'm looking for a word that is not insulting, but anything, anyway, uh, a more broad way of understanding human rights in which it's not only imposing limits on the state, but also putting positive obligations on the state to make sure that other actors, particularly powerful private actors do not harm on human rights, on all human rights, not only freedom of expression, but also this includes freedom of expression. So in that, according to the theory of human rights in the inter-American system, states have, I mean, cannot um, restrict freedom of expression in certain ways, like prior restraint, for example, or, and, oh, and they also have to do things to ensure that there is freedom of expression. Um, and, they, and this is very old. There's a, lo a lot of old uh, jurisprudence in the inter-American system about how particularly in broadcasting, uh, the state has responsibilities to ensure that there's competition, that there is plurality and diversity in the broadcasting market. So freedom of expression can exist. And, and they actually say in that, I think it's almost 40 years old jurisprudence or consultative opinion from the Inter-American Court that um, it's as problematic that the state infringes on rights than power monopolies of broadcasting. Uh, so we also already see a long history of thinking about how competition and freedom of expression uh, play together in this discussion, as Daphne was saying, I think it's important to, to draw on that. Um, and, but that's kind of like the difference for legal geeks who like to read things, but reality is different. The reality is uh, our discussion is heavily influenced by other forces, uh, not really much by what the Interpreting Court said 35 years ago. So, and a good example of that is the regulation that Senator Monreal, a very powerful Senator here basically owns the Senate, whatever he wants, Senate votes for, but he doesn't want, it doesn't go through. He has all the power in the Senate. He is the Senate. It's kind of like Star Wars quote, but it's actually true. Um, and when you read, when you, when you read what it's, uh, the, 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 the uh, justification for the proposal he gave, he cites Germany's law, he cites the DSA, he cites very horrible reformed CDA 230 proposals from the US. I mean, the, the influence of, of his idea comes from the discussions that are going on somewhere else. So we shouldn't dismiss what's going on in the US as Latin American 
advocates or lawyers or whatever you want to call yourself, uh, um, we have to pay attention on what's going on in Europe, what's going on in the US, because that definitely is going to influence. But not only influence in a very uh, benign way, but also they all have their own motives for going through and they're all anxieties and stuff. So here in Mexico, obviously, the government just saw what happened to Trump and said, oh, they're going to do the same to us. And we cannot allow that. But they also see it as an opportunity to, to restrict speech. And that's the, 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 the it seems, seems contradictory, but it's really not that the regulation, it's, it's uh, supposedly aimed at restricting the power of platforms of, of restricting speech. But when you actually read the proposal and, and what the person who wrote it thinks, you see that there is actually an intention of making it easier to restrict speech. And some things are contradictory and doesn't make sense. And we advocacy has been successful in the sense that he actually hasn't introduced the law in Congress, although he said he was going to because he saw the backlash. And right now, this is kind of like dormant. And we might have defeated it for some time, but it will come back sometime. And it will can happen somewhere else in Latin America. This is gonna happen. Um, I'm taking too long to make my point, sorry, because I'm thinking in Spanish and speaking in English, but, um, but I'm going to wrap it up rapidly. Um, just wanted to also point out and, and, and do a plus one to several comments, like um, how trade agreements can also influence and are going to influence. Actually, the U.S. has said that the Canada-U.S.-Mexico agreement is is thought as a blueprint of how negotiations are going to be on trade agreements anywhere else. So you need to be very aware of what USMCA, the treaty between the US, Mexico and Canada says, because it, it, it does kind of export CDA 230, but also on copyright issues, it also exports the MCA, which actually is being challenged in court. And probably this year, the Mexican Supreme Court is going to decide on whether notice and takedown DMCA style is constitutional and or not, well, and that includes whether it's compatible with Article 13 of the American Convention of Human Rights. I don't have high hopes of this Supreme Court of Mexico, but it's going to be a decision that is going to be interesting. And probably from there we can follow up to the inter-American system, and the inter-American system can can 10 years from now <laughs> say something about this, or maybe oh, sooner. I hope. Um, but expect in trade negotiations with the US that the US is gonna say Mexico already accepted this, you should accept it too. And it's gonna be very interesting to see this year what the Supreme Court of Mexico says about this. Um, I also already talked about the influence of Europe, uh, which is just culturally there. Another thing, another force that need, needs to be mentioned is the power of telecom companies. Um, and that, and because uh, there is also a kind of like telecom companies just want to screw big tech companies because they want revenue from them and they have all these big team complex that they are, Google is stealing money from them or whatever, all the over the top language and all of that. Um, so, in this case, Senator Monreal is also very close to some companies, telecom companies, and, and platform regulation is also motivated by this kind of like, I wanna screw you kind of attitude. I wanna screw you big tech, no? Um, and we shouldn't, we should pay attention because that can have different outcomes. And for example, in the discussion about who the regulator is, Mexico is a mess because we have a telecommunications regulator that is also a competition regulator in the telecommunications industry, but you have a competition authority and they all fight about who is the, the, the one that has, has jurisdiction over digital space. A court has said that the competition authority, not the telecommunications authority has, but the, obviously the telecommunications authority is heavily influenced by telecommunications people. And they have also this screw big tech mentality. And I mean, I say that too, screw big tech, but, uh, 
the thing is, it's not, it's not screw big tech in, in favor of users. It's screw big tech probably even harming more uh, um, um, uh, users. So, and the last point that I wanted to make uh, is uh, just just to give a little bit more of substance is about about the risk of, of how tricky these regulations can be to reinforce um, speech control. And, and we already saw it even not in Latin America, even in Facebook. Look how the a, a system designed to review takedowns very quickly became a system to review the failure to take down content in the oversight board. And which I, I'm not saying is bad or anything in that context, but just don't be naive in thinking that systems that sell themselves as designed to review takedowns and to reinstate content when it was improperly taken down can quickly change like, oh, we should also review if something that is up shouldn't be up. No? Uh, and that's, the, that, that's the, the risk because the first thing can seem very, and I've been historically very, I like that idea that we can challenge the power of gatekeepers and make them not delete content. But reality with the institutional weakness, with how access to justice and to judicial systems is always heavily uh, in favor of those that are powerful and against those that are not powerful that cannot access those tools. And this has happened in right to be forgotten interpretations in Mexico. Who has tried to exercise a right to be forgotten interpretation in Mexico? People who have money, who have power, who have abused power, no, it's not the weak big team or something. It's someone powerful, and this is gonna happen again. And we need to be very wary of that. And I'm not canceling the discussion. I'm actually, I'm actually in favor of regulate. If there is regulation, I am in favor of regulation that restricts the power of platforms to restrict speech. But we need to be very careful of the conditions on the ground. For example, something that can be interesting is the issue about the territorial uh, or global takedowns. You know? I think our countries can really do a claim in saying, uh, imposing obligations on platforms of not taking down content just because someone in Austria said that it, they should be taken down. But I took too much time. So I will shut up and we'll just go to Q&A, go more. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you so much, Luis. Um, and we are, we already have three questions in the Q&A, so people keep, posting those questions in the Q&A function that is at the right of the, uh, at the extreme right of the, um, of the options down there in Zoom. Um, and uh, just going back to Daphne for a bit uh, on, on this impact that the, the regulation can have in different countries, right? Where the institutional realities are different, where the, just, just the last point that the Luis was making. Anything you would like to add on, on that front or, or, or just to comment on some of the things that Luis was, was sharing? Well, so I think Luis Fernando has already laid out really well the ways that discussions in other parts of the world get picked up in Latin America as they have in the um, in the case of Senator Monreal's proposal in, in Mexico. So I don't think I have too much to add there. Um, I was going to talk a little bit about the extraterritorial provisions of the DSA. Okay, I'll, I'll put some time into that. Um, so I'll talk first quickly about the what the law actually says, and then secondly, what maybe platforms are likely to do in practice. Um, in terms of what it says, you should think of the DSA as being a lot like the GDPR. Uh, it has explicit extraterritorial reach to govern platforms that um, target European users or just have a lot of European users. So if you are a startup in Mexico, you could be covered by the DSA and you know not even know it unless you happen to hire a European lawyer to tell you this. Uh, also, like the GDPR, it has huge fines. A GDPR has 4% of annual global turnover. DSA has 6%. Um, and, and like the GDPR, it's about a detailed compliance regime, something that you have to plan months or a year in advance to even get your platform up and running to do. And you have to rebuild systems, you have to hire people, um, you have to have a representative on the ground in, in the EU, you have to be able to um, have a relationship with trusted flaggers in each EU country, you have to publish transparency reports, which generally is a good thing, it's a great thing from enormous 
you know, mega platforms. But, you know, if you're a startup in Mexico, knowing you need to publish transparency reports in the EU, is, you know, that's a lot of work and you need to plan around it and it's expensive. Um, so th think of it as a pervasive system type law like the GDPR rather than being about, you know, t individual liability for an individual piece of content. Um, formally, there are sort of two jurisdiction questions. One is, does this law apply to you, startup in Mexico? And the answer is very likely yes, if you kind of meet this threshold of, of users in Europe. Um, and there, there are some different rules depending on your size, um, but the, the odds of it applying to you are relatively high. Then the second one that really applies for content moderation is, okay, even if it applies to you, does it require you to take down speech in Mexico? Or, you know, say if it violates Austrian law, <laughs> do you have to take it down just in Austria or take it down globally? Um, and there, the, um, unlike any previous EU instrument I'm aware of, um, the DSA does speak explicitly to this. And, and what it says is that when a court orders takedown, it should spell out whether the takedown is, which territory the takedown applies to. Um, so it starts out with this idea that takedowns will be territorial. That's good. <laughs> you know, it doesn't presume global impact, but it hands every single court in the EU the power to decide, well, oh, in this case, though, this should be global. Um, and which is a power that they already have under the Glavishnig Piacek Facebook Ireland case, which Luis Fernando was referencing, which said um, Austria could, based on its national law, if it decided it wanted to, order global takedown of speech that uh, was defamatory of a politician under Austrian law. Um, so it's definitely uh, something to worry about. I have a wish for impact litigators to do something with this. And I'm gonna save it for later because it's really nerdy and detailed and probably only five of you care about jurisdiction impact litigation. Um, but if there's time later in the q and I would love to get back to it. Practically, um, you know, what are platforms really going to do? Well, it is generally easier to adopt one rule and apply it globally than to have a different rule in every country and do different targeting and different messaging to users and you know, geo-blocking and blah, blah, blah. This is why platforms have an incentive to adopt more and more expansive terms of service prohibitions, well, it's one reason, in order to avoid having to pay a lawyer to analyze whether something violates Mexican law or maybe violates the law in Mexico, but not Peru. And so you have to take it down one place and not the other. Um, if your TOST just prohibits all of it, then you can do a single thing globally and that's easier and cheaper. Um, so I would assume, this is a very crude assumption, but I would assume with the DSA that platforms will, big platforms will want to apply the cheap parts globally and the expensive parts only in Europe. Uh, the cheap parts are about taking things down. The expensive parts are about having you know, complicated appeal processes. So, you know, maybe they apply an internal <clears throat> appeal process globally, or maybe they apply it just in Europe. Um, even more expensive parts are about giving users a right to go do a sort of alternative dispute resolution process under Article 18. Surely that will only be for European users or to, or to go to court and challenge things. You know, there are things that I think will be, they will limit to Europe as much as they can because they are expensive and burdensome. Um, so I will, I'll wrap up there because I think we want to save time for Q&A and I know Alishka has important things to tell us. That, 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 that point that you just, you just raised makes it very important for more than three people in this call to just go into jurisdiction litigation. So I hope that this is creating more more ways for from people who are listening to just get into this is going to be very important. And judging for the revelations that we have, for example, on how different companies, like Facebook, for example, right? There's a recent revelation about how they respond differently, which is something that we we anyway uh, uh, wished. Uh, I mean, we guessed anyway, right? That they respond differently to different markets. So markets that are more of more importance to them will generate more compliance and more uh, involvement and so on. So I, I think it's very interesting this idea of the expensive parts and the, and the cheap parts. And um, okay, and having in mind that we have been speaking about the DSA and about the context in Europe, 
Uh, we have seen some things that are not perfect, some things that are, could be misinterpreted that are already being mis misinterpreted in different parts of the world. Um, you know, so maybe for a critical contextualization of the regulatory processes in Europe, how those are going, what are the trends that we are seeing in our team in, in Europe according to these developments around the world, uh, and what are the things that we could do better and, or try to avoid uh, in Latin America. Our Europe policy analyst, Eriska Pirkova, she's also our uh, de facto content uh, governance lead in our, in our global work as well. She works from our Brussels office, and she's going to uh, share some thoughts on that. Great, now it should work. Hi there, thank you very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here today. Um, I'm actually uh, tuning in from Brussels, uh, so uh, directly from the from the kitchen where all of this is being cooked and we've been the part of the process from the very, very start. And maybe just to give you a perspective of a civil society that has been actively engaging on the DSA file, as well as on the other sectoral legislation that has already been mentioned on the call by excellent contributions authored by Daphne and Joanne, um, we started working on DSA already back in 2019 when there was absolutely no draft yet and there was just a rumor spreading around the city and around the union that this big legislation that will ultimately review the e-commerce directive, the initial main uh, tool that governs intermediary liability model in Europe, which European Commission was sort of rejecting to actually reopen that uh, directive for a very long time. So that something like that is coming. And during the first initial months, we've been all working with the leaks that were coming from the European Commission. The leaks are sort of a common process here in Brussels, sometimes intentionally, sometimes non-intentionally to actually obtain the feedback from all relevant stakeholders, including civil societies or also private uh, companies that were investing a lot of money into a huge pressure and lobbying that is currently taking place in Brussels around the ESA and Digital Market Act, DMA, that we haven't mentioned yet during this debate, as well as European Democracy Action Plan. So I will try to walk you through the landscape that we are engaging on and, and why all of these pieces are actually important in this big puzzle of platform governance that the European Union is trying to put together. Uh, so uh, we published our DSA position already in October 2020, and we started developing those uh, back in 2019, uh, using actually any kind of documents and, and resources and, and expertise from academia and researchers and everything that we saw around to actually identify those priorities and especially to create a joint action from the civil society uh, we learned of a lesson in the copyright debate before that was a big battle in European Union in the field of content governance and platform governance. Um, and we knew that our unified voices will be very, very important and that we, he we need to avoid as many contradictions as possible. Uh, within the DSA debate, uh, Access Now have been working on more traditional topics around DSA that has already been mentioned, from intermediary reliability, preserving the conditional model as stated in the e-commerce directive through the prohibition of general monitoring to tailored notice and action procedures. Today, looking at DSA, many of those things we got and many we didn't. So we often refer now knowing what is actually within the DSA as a good start with a lot of imperfect solutions. Um, and I will also maybe then touch the ground a little to tell you how far we still need to go and that we are very much just at the beginning of DSA process. So the European regulatory and European legislative process take quite some time. And those who were the part of the GDPR discussions or those who actually follow the development of GDPR know that it can be a several years long process. So um, it's great that DSA is here together with DMA and other initiatives, but we will still have a lot of possibilities to impact the text, to influence the text, um, and to kind of get in their ideas and proposals that are more human rights centric than what we got right now. Access Now departing position has always been the human rights centric regulation of platform government of platforms within the EU context. And we as a global organization have to be extra careful when we are proposing concrete amendments and suggestions for the DSA proposal, precisely due to the defect because it will have that far reaching uh, impact beyond the EU. Uh, we also witnessed and worked on the legislation that is not following exactly human rights centric approach. 
the online terrorist content regulation that the European Parliament will vote on in on 28th of April and LIBE committee, which is the Committee of Civil Liberties, will actually cast its vote already tomorrow, is the great example of how, in our view, human rights centric regulation of content governance or content and platforms should not look like. Uh, it still contains the same old mistake, the swift solutions that are relying on the swift removals of user-generated content, vague definitions, one-hour time frame removals. Um, many of those provisions that were actually even struck down by the French Constitutional Court in the Avia law, which was the proposed law against hate speech, and this decision was delivered by the Constitutional Council last summer. However, the same provisions can be still found, or similar provisions can be still found found within the online uh, terrorist content regulation. And if you're interested in supporting civil society's efforts that access now together with EDRI and Liberties was leading here in Europe, we invite you to read our joint statement, which was signed by over 70 organizations now, and to follow our Twitter for more information and update and the initiatives that we are actually doing against these regulation, even though we are running out of time, and even though we're fully aware that the regulation will probably be adopted at the end of the day. We also also saw those national legislative proposals that Jean already mentioned and how they can potentially erode country of origin or country of establishment principle. Jean met France, uh, mentioned France, but France is not the only one. Poland is actually legislating in a very similar manner. And interestingly enough, even though DSA actually seeks to harmonize a relatively fragmented landscape within the European Union, these proposals and their proponents suddenly speak about the need to acknowledge uh, cultural and contextual differences that member states ultimately have among each other. Even though we could argue that this is the time to live by the slogan of the European Union, unified in diversity. Um, and they will ultimately actually impose obstacles in the harmonization process. And it's also quite interesting to see how uh, prior to DSA, we had uh, proposals coming also from Austria and after DSA uh, draft, which was launched in December 2020, these proposals keep coming up and popping up in various member states. And even in those member states that were actively weakening the rule of law and fundamental rights protection for many years now. And uh, that's of course Poland that I've already mentioned, but also Hungary initially announced their intention to regulate platforms. And I think that this is a, this is a good example to see how also United States impact the European debate because the Hungarian proposal was initially in response to the deplatforming of Trump uh, uh, by large online platforms in the United States and justified by the need to protect conservative values. So it was interesting way to observe that twist of the freedom of expression argument in the hands of rather authoritarian regimes in Europe. In the meantime, Hungary actually withdrew its effort to regulate platforms, but the Poland proposal is still uh, alive and kicking, and we will see where the French proposal will take us, but with the high probability, it will be adopted after all. Um, also, we hear from the governments in Europe to include their, their kind of intentions, or at least some of them, to include into the scope of DSA uh, the category of content such as potentially harmful but legal content, which in itself is a very vague uh, category of content. And at the moment, uh, and that's one of the novel approaches DSA has. It strictly focuses on the illegal content and it focuses on the processes such as transparency and accountability uh, through which ultimately even this category of content can be actually tackled. And that brings me to another interesting development in the EU that I think would be interesting for many of you to keep following uh, because it will certainly inform the response mechanisms uh, elsewhere, not only in the EU, and that so-called European Democracy Action Plan, which specifically seeks to tackle potentially harmful but legal content such as disinformation and European Democracy Action Plan, especially the communication that was released by the Commission at the end of 2020 as well, very, very uh, near to the date when DSA was actually launched. Uh, sheds the light on how these mitigation of risks measures that was already mentioned by Joanne and also by Daphne within the DSA uh, will function. 
and it speaks and explains these quite complex system of co-regulatory backstep, which consists of code of practices and code of disinformations, which are rather co or self-regulatory measures created by the EU that mainly consist of voluntary commitments of, pl of platforms to enforce their transparency requirements and other elements that these co-regulatory measures actually contain. We see, as was also already mentioned, that, for instance, the importance of human rights impact assessments is quite downgraded by the DSA, and it puts a lot of emphasis on, on mitigation of risk measures instead of mandatory human rights impact assessment, which, in our view, as civil society defending human rights of online users, should come first. And Access Now have been developing lately recommendations precisely looking into the section on um, uh, Article 26, 27 and DSA, uh, of the DSA, um, and how to actually strengthen those, among other things. Um, so uh, there will be also another regulatory proposals coming up from the European Union as a part of this big package. One of them has already been announced, uh, which will be looking at the regulation of political advertisement or politically sponsored content online, um, which will be a legally binding regulation. Um, and then there are specific provisions within the DSA that will be certainly sort of, I would say, battlefields. Uh, so perhaps just to inform you a little where we are currently standing this rather complicated legislative process at the EU level. The DSA is just about to enter the European Parliament, and this is also the period of time when the member states of the European Union are concluding their positions on DSA and providing concrete responses on individual articles within the DSA. And it's quite interesting to watch and, and, and see those positionings of member states because it tells us a lot about the reasoning and the logic which we believe will not only be apparent in, inside of the EU but also elsewhere and uh, positions of France and Germany and the, the founding member states of the European Union have a tradition of impacting legislation beyond the EU as we have already heard from others. Um, so the DSA will be entering European Parliament. That means that this is a good moment for civil societies to express their views and to communicate their views to the members of the European Parliament. Um, and of course, we as a civil society operating globally and having a strong presence in Europe will do our best to help you uh, to, to help you to make your voices heard in Brussels as well, and to inform this debate and make MEPs more aware in the concrete terms and operational recommendations, how far reaching consequences this legislation can have beyond the borders of the European Union. Um, however, we have a long journey ahead of us. This will be the process that will last at least three years, if not longer. There are many estimates and many bets right now flying in the air how quickly we will manage to conclude the essay. Um, uh, but there will be a lot of work done and a lot of opportunities for all of you how to step into the process. Um, I step here. I will also share access now positioning on DSA in the chat uh, for those of you who haven't seen it yet, but uh, you might have. And if there are any further questions, please, uh, we are here for you to answer them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ellie. I, I, you actually just replied to one of the questions in the Q&A, which was from Agostino del Campo, just to ask how can civil society in Latin America get engaged? in this regulatory process, right? And what we can do practically and, and, and specifically. So maybe if, if you, you agree with that and if everyone here agrees with that, we can share with the list of people that we have listed as participants on their emails. Um, we can share probably some resources, key dates, key opportunities for people to just uh, um, organize themselves and maybe send joint submissions, I think would be an interesting uh, piece of work because I know uh, that we are all very, very busy. So uh, just to use the time um, to the best uh, of our of our uh, abilities, sorry, uh, we'll just go to the Q&A. So the first one is for Daphne, uh, for, for something that she mentioned, and from Agustina del Campo. So uh, you mentioned that the mass carrier claims have failed in the US before. Um, do you see any room in the US to distinguish going forward uh, between mass carrier obligations for content intermediaries, but also other kinds of providers, like the Google Play Store, for example, or the Apple Store. Is there a difference to be made there and in terms of viability of this kind of mandates? Yeah, so I think as a matter of principle, there absolutely should be a difference. Um, and you know, this is why many countries have always had a concept of net neutrality, 
at the level of ISPs or access providers where they really do have to carry everything. Um, and then as you go further up the technical stack, you get to purely consumer facing you know, edge providers like Facebook uh, from whom we have historically expected content moderation and you know, them to have some control over the, the speech on the platform. Um, and for people interested in that question, at least in the US legal framework, Anne-Marie Brighty has an article called Remediating Social Media, I think, um, that's really good on kind of the policy reasons for that distinction. So then the question is, you know, in the middle of the stack, what should the rules be for Cloudflare, for DNS providers, or for uh, payment processors? You know, should we treat them more like an entity with net neutrality obligations or more like an entity that we expect to exercise some kind of editorial or content moderation function? Um, the App Store is a really interesting example uh, for a reason that relates to US law. So as I talk about in that who do you sue piece, um, Justice Kavanaugh is this really interesting swing vote for this because he had a rule, an opinion, a dissent before he was on the Supreme Court saying, of course the government could never compel either ISPs or Google or Facebook or YouTube to carry content they don't want to because that would violate these companies' speech rights. Um, except, said Justice Kavanaugh, except if someone could make out a competition claim that would, that then it would be justified. So in his analysis, the only question is a competition question, whereas the older um, case law suggests like, oh, what about media pluralism? You know, like maybe there's some other factors here, but he, he thinks it's just competition. Um, also, Justice Kavanaugh was the author of the Supreme Court's ruling in Apple v. Pepper, uh, which allowed a competition claim to go forward about Apple's App Store. So there we have probably the most important vote on the Supreme Court saying must carry can succeed if there's a competition problem and Apple's App Store might have a competition problem. And then fast forward a little bit and you get the App Store kicking Parler off. And so um, right wing American pundits, you know, really think that they should be forced to carry Parler. Uh, which is a haven for everything from legitimate conservative discourse to stuff most people would consider hate speech. Um, and just today, Apple announced that they are reinstating Parler. So I, I think you know it is possible that there is a way to have a different carriage obligation for the App Store, and the path to that, I think, lies through competition. Thanks so much, Daphne. Um, so... Do you think that this, this, I mean, Kavanaugh's exposition and so on, would still just open the door to the claim or does it go a little bit into the merits of how that common courage should happen? It's just opening the door, right? It, it's just opening the door. I mean, historically, the only way this has happened is by Congress passing a big complicated law that is enforced by the FCC. So I don't think he's opening the door to just random tort claims leading to carriage obligations, um, but he is maybe opening the door to something that looks like, kind of like broadcast regulation or kind of like cable regulation. Perfect, thank you so much, Stephanie. Um, the next one comes from Natalia Suasso and goes to Joanne. Joanne, you mentioned the issue of the regulators and how some of them could be, according to the situation, um, not the best option for the for the new authorities that can be uh, thought about for platforms. So, in your vision, in in an ideal world, just not thinking in the countries uh, and their issues and the particular issues, what would be the what would be the composition and the and the mandate of an ideal regulator? This is pr probably like a subject for an entire seminar, but you have three minutes to so to solve it to solve the problem of the regulators. <laughs> I mean, what I can say is that at least the, the differences or I mean the new trends that um, I mean these uh, new regulators may have because for if we compare I mean um, these digital possible digital regulators to audiovisual regulators we see that the broadcasting regulators basically directly regulate content that is broadcast and when it comes at least under the DSA scheme, uh, the, these new digital regulators would regulate the way platforms moderate content, which is probably a different kind of regulation. 
no? uh, in most of the cases. No? Uh, here we also have something that uh, Eliska mentioned is that here we are not talking only about, I mean, traditional statutory regulation. We are also talking about self-regulation. I mean, because European legislation, I mean, puts a lot, so lots of stress on self-regulation and also on the notion that um, you can find it in many, many pieces of European legislation, but nobody knows exactly, I mean, the, 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 what it means, which is the notion of co-regulation, which means, I mean, granting certain powers to, to platforms to self-regulate and also at the same time providing some backstep powers, backstop powers, sorry, to, to, to um, regulatory authorities to intervene uh, at some point. Huh? But still, most of the core regulation is still to happen. I mean, and we still need to see this. So in, in the future, in an ideal world, world, probably what we'll see, uh, what we may see is a combination between self-regulation, core regulation and statutory regulation. That's, that's the first thing. Um, therefore, here we are talking about a, an authority that needs to be independent. That is clear and the notion of independence, we, we really know what it means, but still it's ideal, it's an ideal thing because it's hard to find a, a regulator that is truly independent anywhere in the world, perhaps some say Ofcom is um, I mean, particularly independent, but even Ofcom I mean, has its, its issues. Um, but the second thing is that here we are talking about, I mean, uh, I mean, as members of regulators of uh, regulatory bodies, not people who are expert in content or who are expert in communication, but people who can really understand how a platform operates and uh, which are, I mean, on, and to what extent um, the platforms really fulfill the duties that are expressed in very big ways at the level of legislation. And this is another completely level of expertise. So in other words, I don't think that current audiovisual regulators are particularly feel, uh, fit uh, or prepared to undertake such a task because it's something completely, uh, completely different. There's this tendency to say, what, what is the closest to digital, to, to the regulation of digital platforms, audiovisual? because it's even closer than telecom. So because it has to do with content, et cetera, et cetera. So these folks will do the job. Huh? And we see that, that the, for example, the Irish regulator is in the process of preparing itself, et cetera. But again, I think that the, the kind of expertise, apart from independence, huh? independence from the government and independence from the sector, from the industry, which is so as important as independence from the government. But apart from this independence, I think that the kind of expertise is very specific. I mean, it means understanding the way platforms operate, um, understanding how basic uh, principles established in the law can be interpreted and applied to a specific case. And also, I mean, being able to, um, let's say, engage in a dialogue with platforms because the way uh, regulation will, will operate is not gonna be any more like, I mean, I'm the regulator, I'm telling you what to do. If you don't do it, I mean, you'll get in trouble. I think that some level of interaction, dialogue, understanding will need to take place uh, in order for both parties to do what they are supposed to do. No? So I think that here we are talking about a different type of regulation, diff diff regulators, different type of expertise, uh, which can we can still, we have problems to exactly define what kind of expertise we're talking about here. Thank you. I like that. Uh, I like that. Uh, that's, this ideal dialogue and interaction uh, was part of the posing of the question as well. The ideal world regul regulator, right? Um, so fingers crossed that something close to that will happen. So from Paula Cortorial for Daphne, um, how do you see the categorization that the DSA does? You know, that's distinguishing between very large online platforms and smaller ones and so on, as a sustainable approach to platform governance? Because uh, here she poses the the case of the Brazilian Marco Civil, who just has only two buckets uh, for intermediate liability rules just ISPs and content providers. Do you, do you see that these categorization efforts are sustainable or useful in all cases? Um, yeah, so before I speak to that, I just want to second what Juan just said. You know, I, I've been kind of blithely saying, oh, this looks like communications regulation and, you know, that's the model in the US, et cetera, and it's very much the model being adopted in, in the UK and in Ireland. But the idea that regulators whose whole experience is with broadcast and cable are therefore able to set the rules for what you and I and our grandmothers and journalists get to say online, 
that is crazy. <laughs> you know? like, we should be very, very resistant to the idea that experience regulating, you know, primetime situation comedies makes them eligible to control all of our speech. Um, okay, moving on <laughs> to Paula's questions and apologies, Paula. Um, I, I think there's two kind of categorizations that are important. One is based on the technological function of the intermediary. And I do think it's quite legitimate to have different rules for different technological functions. And I don't know what the right number of buckets is. You know, the US DMCA breaks intermediaries into four categories uh, with different rules for search engines versus hosts versus caching providers versus transit providers. Um, maybe there should be more, maybe there should be fewer. Two sounds a little clumsy. <laughs> um, but then the separate question is based on size, you know, regardless of what technological function you're providing, or let's let me say that differently, assuming what we're talking about is hosts and social media and, you know, Reddit and WordPress and Facebook and Twitter and YouTube, assuming we're talking about those guys, um, I, I definitely think there should be different rules based on size. Uh, like if there are going to be new rules like this, the rules for the mega giants should not apply to the little guys because it will kill them. <laughs> like they will never be able to compete with incumbents. And I actually, you know, if, if I were writing these laws, which nobody lets me do, um, I would have rules that are just for the big guys and then figure out later everybody else. And by big guys, I mean like the top 10 or 50 or, you know, this really small number of platforms compared to the huge number of smaller, you know, knitting blogs or fan websites or, you know, comments on online newspapers or um, user reviews on retail websites, you know, this huge swath of other kinds of companies that and, and nonprofits that might get hit by these kinds of laws. Um, so I, I am in favor of size-based restrictions. Uh, I don't think the DSAs are set in the right place. Um, you know, I, I think that there are heavy burdens that will hit a lot of medium-sized and, and smaller companies in ways that probably, to my mind, set the wrong balance between competition and diversity goals on the one hand and content regulation goals on the other. Um, but you know, obviously, there's there's room for disagreement on that. I would actually love to hear what Alishka has to say on on this question because I know she's been thinking about it a lot. Absolutely, and Ellie, since we will have you with the mic, you can also address one of the other questions that are direct at you, <laughs> like for example, human rights impact assessments uh, and the service category distinctions. That is pretty much the same question. So. Uh, thank you very much for this. And actually, if I could then very quickly speak to content recommender systems too, which is the question by Jose Renato, which I think it's an excellent question as well. Uh, and we've been working on those quite a lot together with other civil societies here uh, and elsewhere. Um, so regarding the distinction, I totally agree with you, Daphne, and I actually keep nodding here, nodding here also when Joan was speaking um, about the media regulators, because this is actually the trend that we saw within the national legislation as well. And we often underline how underfunded and under-resourced they already are. And it was quite interesting to see that in the context of the Austrian proposal that came out in autumn 2020, how uh, national media regulator of Austria uh, even though the state was offering extra resources and capacity rejected that while saying that we simply cannot do that. Um, and it was, I can eventually actually share that opinion because that was quite, quite interesting. Um, regarding the distinction, we've been uh, strongly uh, in favor. We, we also, in our own positioning, we've been uh, calling uh, for better regulation of so-called online gatekeepers, which is now the term that is within the Digital Market Act. It didn't actually make it to the Digital Services Act. The uh, Digital Services Act uses the term very large online platform, so-called WAP. Uh, there are lots of um, different um, feelings about this term. It's a, it's a bit strange term and everyone had to get used to it. Uh, but we also understand and kind of welcome actually the distinction of the obligations for the very large, very large online platforms and medium size or the smaller size online platforms. Nevertheless, there are some criteria within the DSA, for instance, precisely those that regulate content recommender systems, 
where we feel that um, online platforms that curate or moderate the content should be subjected to those criteria too, within the capacity that they are able to, within respecting their size and, and actually the nature of the services and the number of the users and other elements. Um, within our DSA position, we also provided a set of criteria that we uh, consider to be significant for to distinguish between media scale or small scale platforms versus the very, very large online platforms. Um, so, of course, there is always the risk with this distinction, and I think that has already been mentioned that this will lead to actually enforcement of even uh, of those who are already powerful and dominant on the account of, of those that are smaller. And we've been thinking a lot again, and I can connect that to the content recommender systems there too, about what will be the, the exact way how to actually control the dominance and give the space to those smaller platforms and to boost the competition. Um, and so we can potentially actually have alternatives to uh, very large online platforms such as Facebook. And within the content recommender systems and answering the question in the chat, uh, we don't feel that DSA actually goes far enough. Transparency is essential, but transparency is the way how to get there. And I would refer everyone also to the recently published or two months ago, um, uh, the opinion of the European Data Protection Supervisor on Digital Services Act, where he specifically addresses the issue of content recommender systems and puts even more uh, demanding criteria on what these systems actually should comply with and how that should be implemented. Uh, one of uh, access now uh, demands from the very start was, for instance, opt-in by default for all online users. Um, uh, and uh, that means uh, that in our view, that will really safeguard the choice of the user and somehow return the control back to the user. And another step could be if these big platforms are made interoperable. Now, interoperability as a criteria is being included within the Digital Market Act under Article 6. But in our view, interoperability could, for instance, open the space for so-called third-party plugins when the independent stakeholders with the expertise, whether these are civil societies, could actually curate the content if you as a user choose actively to actually uh, work with these with these third party plugins and let them to curate the content for you in a very transparent manner. These are still ideas that we work around um, and we are still developing together in cooperation with other organizations. And I would definitely refer you to the work of Europe of Electronic Frontiers Foundations, for instance, or Article 19, who's been doing some excellent work on this topic. Um, very quickly to human rights impact assessments. Uh, we are uh, now developing our position in the context of DSA. Access now have been advocating for strong human rights impacts assessments uh, within our AI work. And I would definitely refer to you uh, again to the work of the Council of Europe and CAHAI Committee at the Council of Europe that has very concrete ideas about how these human rights impact assessments could be made operational um, and how to guarantee that also marginalized groups um, have actually their equal say. We uh, also think that the measure, measures, if these human rights impact assessments are, for instance, conducting, conducted solely by online platforms, which more or less seems to be the case within the current wording of the DSA, then at least these actors, the independent stakeholders with the uh, relevant expertise should have a power to contest these decisions. Um, and the way how the currently the risk assessment under Article 26 of DSA is being formulated, it again relies too much on the platforms to first say, yes, there is actually a significant risk stemming from our uh, operations. And only if that significant risk exists, then they are obliged to deploy and to implement all these other mitigation of risks measures which for us is it's highly problematic um, because we also saw on the example of GDPR that very often platforms say, well, there are no significant risks stemming from our operations and don't really comply or implement any mitigation of risk measures as a consequence of that. Um, so I would definitely refer you there and also the work of the European non-for-profit uh, 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 law center. Uh, the, the guys there are doing excellent work and put forward very, very great standards on human rights impact assessments and we've been in a close cooperation with them um and then uh finally um i think that i, I have to do a time check there Eddie. absolutely um but i think i answer most of it but if there is anything else please let me know <laughs> okay <laughs> just 
yeah, it was long and okay. So I mean, it was a long question because there were like three questions in, in one. So thank you so much for for doing the effort of, of of answering that. So we are running very very short on time. I want to leave the last one for Luis Fernando, who hasn't spoken enough um, about the intervention of the of the um, rapporteur for freedom of expression from the OAS for stopping the Montreal proposal. Do you think that that was uh, a key intervention to get the proposal? Uh, maybe in the freezer for now. And how do you foresee that we could use the, the rubber to your office as, as an ally on this? Yes, definitely, it was key. Yeah, not only the, the rapporteur from the Inter-American system, but also UNESCO. There was the office of, uh, of UNESCO in Mexico, uh, kind of like got involved, did a panel. And that was key to convince Central Monreal that he, was, he didn't know what he was talking about. And that this was a global discussion and uh, one country should not decide these things by themselves and stuff like that help. But I, and also in the American system, the rapporteur he's, he's very interested in in, a pro, in creating a process that uh, can culminate in principles or in a thematic report or something. Uh, and I think it would be very interesting to seize that opportunity to to make the inter-American system have a voice, um, a more stronger voice in the global discussion. Uh, I will uh, commend everyone here to get involved in that process that it's gonna probably go through this year and maybe next. Um, and I, I understand that the rapporteur is going to inform soon um, about this. And there's things that I think are, are interesting also to push locally, uh, for example, it's likely that if from Mexico eventually some law comes, we might be able to push for or sneak in some anti-global removals regulation that says you cannot take down content that is not illegal here. And it will be very interesting to see what's gonna what platforms are gonna do when Europe or some jurisdictions tells them you have to remove everywhere, and someone says you can't remove it here. We'll see what, what happens when that happens, if that happens, um, but yeah. So yeah, very important. That's the that's case. The, that's the impact litigation that I want someone to bring. Exactly, so that was what we wanted to yeah. say. <laughs> <laughs> so reach out to Daphne, actually. And, and I see several <laughs> issues here that, that, that merit the follow-up. The impact litigation front, how to engage in the DSA regulatory process, even more learning sessions. So maybe next time we can do something based on questions and we we'll just focus on the questions specifically. I mean, several things that we can see going. Also, there's the engagement in Mexico about the, the, the trade uh, agreement and its inconstitutionality um, and, and, and that decision on the Supreme Court and several other things. Also, uh, the Robert your office at the inter-American uh, system level and so on. So several things there for a follow-up that we will do on email. So we are one minute, ahead of time. So if you want to say in 30 seconds, uh, a closing remark uh, or a goodbye, we thank very much our panelists today. So if you want to say goodbye or something else in 30 seconds, the floor is yours. And thank you everyone for staying. We have a great retention rate. Everyone who started is still with us. <laughs>